Good morning. Well, I caught some of you by surprise and others are still coming in, so let's try that one more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I see the pastor's wife is over visiting people. So we're going to sing. Let's all stand. Higher ground. feedback I'm hearing you sing, it sounds like you know this one. So let's sing it out even more on the second and the third and the fourth verse. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts are Six, if you prefer to use the hymnal, blessed be the name.
Denise is coming to help with announcements, and we're going to take our time because there are some really important things going on, and I forgot my clicker, so let me get it. But lots of things going on uh, in the coming weeks, some really good things. Good morning. Please let your friends know that we are live on Facebook and on YouTube and elsewhere this morning. And you can comment at comments at calvarybrenham.org. And we have a license for the music that we use. You hear we that, do. Facebook? So don't shut us down. <laughs> Pastor and men will meet Tuesday at 10. Share care prayer on Wednesday nights, meal and fellowship at 530, Bible study at 6, and youth also meet at 6 o'clock downstairs. And there is a sign-up sheet if you would like to help with the meals. Young at Heart will meet this Tuesday, May 17th at 6 o'clock. Nursing Home Ministry, Sunday, June 5th, 2.30 Brenham Nursing and Rehab and 3.30 Silver Sage. And it looks like all of our nursing homes are open now and welcoming visits. So, And we have some good folks who do our nursing home ministry. If you would like to be involved in that, we do what we call Calvary Blue Shirts. We all have a blue, is it a golf shirt? Mm -hmm. or a, and it says Calvary logo on it. If you would like to help out, we will provide you the shirt. So just let Denise know. And since we have a couple of weeks before this happens, there's time to get that in. If she has to order some more, we try to keep some in stock. And then a trip to the Brookwood community, Friday, June the 10th. There is a sign-up sheet on the back table if you would like to go there. They will do some shopping and have lunch. And so they do need to make reservations. So if you would like to go, please go ahead and sign up for that. And Becoming Mature, we will be having a meal on Saturday, June 11th here at Calvary, and there's more information following. And this is Dr. Bruce Baker's organization that his family has taken over, and we actually have an opportunity, if it all works out, for an African pastor to be with us on that Saturday, June 11, and then the next slide is going to talk about the Sunday morning as communion. If this all works out, then we will also have communion with him uh, with our church so it'll be like having communion with the church of africa so uh, we'll be giving you more information about this but save the date june 11 and then june 12 sunday morning is our lord's supper service and hopefully we'll be able to share communion with the church of africa and then washington county ems we have a group of ladies and men can do it as well that have started to provide baked goods to the ems people once a month so we have the different months laid out. So if you would like to help with that, there's some sign-up sheet back there. And, and as you know, I am the chaplain for Washington County EMS. And I actually got called out last night on a situation that I can't share all the details. But it is something that if it had gone wrong, you'd be reading about it in the paper today. But God was so good in using our people and the people at the ER. And I'll have to find out what I'm allowed to say from those who would give me permission to say it but suffice it to say that uh, God is doing good stuff and uh, he is at work boy I wish I could say more <laughs> and then Miss Jenny and all of our nurses thank you for all that you do and, and not just Jenny we have other nurses among us and people who have been nurses and retired from nursing and uh, actually, there was this also in the Reader's Digest, kind of uh, the, the TV guide kind of part of the paper. And um, it is Nurse Appreciation Week, and we want to celebrate some of our local this, nurses. Good morning to Jenny Lynn. Your mom and dad say you are the best hospice nurse out there. You're caring and always encouraging others. So thank you, Jenny Lynn. Yeah. So she was on national Houston television. <laughs> That's really cool. That was pretty cool. And then car clinic, we had a great turnout. We had some new volunteers that were trained yes. yesterday. and We had we missed some of our regulars, and I understand some of you forgot. Some of you had conflicts, but we got to train some new people, and we had a great time. We had over 24 cars. We had 24. That's we awesome. We had one showed up at the last minute as we were shutting down. Something happened, and Community Bulletin Board has us doing car clinic from 8 to noon when our paid advertising clearly says 8 to 11, our Facebook says 8 to 11. So somebody showed up after 11. We went ahead and honored them with a gift certificate. They looked like they uh, really could use one and, and were very appreciative. And those of you who ministered downstairs as we're servicing cars, there are people downstairs ministering to these people, and they're coming in for breakfast. and. Uh, I think you would agree that a lot of those folks who came in 
really needed the service and really appreciated it. And even after we serviced their car, they would not leave. <laughs> Some of them just stayed. They just needed the fellowship. So we are providing a very valuable service, and I'm proud of Calvary for doing that. Single mom, don't have a mechanic in the family? Bring your car to our free car clinic at Calvary Baptist Church. Have some refreshments while we check your battery belts and hoses and check and adjust your tire pressure and fluids. Then we'll give you a coupon for a free oil change. This is Riley Guinness, granddaughter of Pastor Billy Sutherland of Calvary Baptist Church of Brenham, inviting you to our free car clinic this Saturday, May 14th from 8 to 11 a.m. We're on Niebuhr Street across from the tax office. For more information, visit calvarybrenham.org. (laughs) we didn't have this last sunday in time for car clinic so i thought i'd throw this in this sunday even though it was yesterday but uh, melinda did my national day of prayer ad and then riley did my car clinic ad and then i think i'll be doing some welcome to calvary ads upcoming but uh good stuff going on all over the place and then we still will receive the kleenex for the collection boxes out in the hallway through the month of may and we'll do something different in june and i forgot one thing about the ems i think that in today's banner there's an ems section and there's an article about the chaplain and calvary baptist church so look for that in today's banner special pull out section ems and then before i forget we have someone that was honored at the school district that is teacher of the month for the junior high carol holloway <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's for, oh teacher of the year that's awesome teacher of the year wow and then can check, i have your autograph when we cl- all right <laughs> and then check calvarybrenham.org for the latest news and updates and i know that was a long time on announcements but such a lot of good stuff is happening children would you come And we had set aside Pilgrim's Progress for a while because we've had Palm Sunday and Easter and special thing Mother's Day, and we are back to... And there's, just like two boys. and there's just two boys that are walking along, and they have all kinds of challenges. And every time something really exciting is about to happen, we all run out of time. Out of time. Let's see if that happens today. Expand our time period. But first, we need to expand our time period. Yeah, whenever you're so excited, and then boom. (laughs) Oh, I love this. I love this. Uh, Now, people, especially if you're new, during the singing of Jesus Loves Me, the children are going to be looking for anybody who's grumpy looking. Everybody needs to smile. Jesus loves me. That's a good thing. Whether you're a youth or an adult, you need to smile when we sing Jesus Loves Me. And here it comes on the piano. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. I have the slide in the wrong order. That's my fault. That's not something Denise did. We're going to do Pilgrim's Progress, and then we'll pray. But why can't you have it on first? We, we could pray before and after. Yeah, all right. So last Sunday, we came to Demas and the Silver Mine, and he was telling Pilgrim and Hopeful, hey, come over here because there's all kinds of silver. You can have as much silver as you'd like. And we ran out of time, so we're picking up here. Hopeful said, oh, that's wonderful, let's do it. We'll just get as much silver as we can carry. And Pilgrim says, no, 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 we don't need to do that because we're supposed to stay on a straight and narrow way. If the silver mine were on this path here, maybe that'd be okay. But no, we're getting tempted to go off the path, and we're not going to do that. So Demas said, well, hold on then, wait for me, and I'll come with you. And Pilgrim said, no. You're not a follower of the king, because if you were a follower of the king, you never would have tried to lure us off of the path like that. So we'll just be on our way and traveling on. 
they became very weary, especially Christian. His name is also Pilgrim. He just got tired and he was just barely walking along and barely able to keep his eyes open and trudging along and hopeful, was helping as best he could, kind of encouraging and helping prop him up and walking along. And they got to somewhere that, that there's got to be somewhere to rest in safety, but they don't want to get off the path because they've seen lions and they've seen rocks and they've, oh, they've just been through all kinds of trouble. And it would be so nice just to lay down in safety and to rest. And Pilgrim was talking about the palace beautiful and how nice that was to be able to rest there and to be ministered to and then get back on the straight and narrow path again. And, and maybe they'll find some place like that, but they kept on and they're so tired and there's just nowhere to rest. They're pushing on, they're struggling to keep going. Have you ever been so tired you can barely even walk? Probably not because you have a lot more energy than the rest of us. Some of these folks know, just so tired, you just it's even hard just to put one foot in that. You just want to lay down and take a nap. And they came to a wide spot in the King's Highway. Now, a wide spot, it's still the King's Highway. It just kind of fans out a little bit, and there's a wide spot. And right beside this wide spot was a nice river. Always nice to see when you're hot and thirsty and dry to see a nice river. And this was the river of life flowing right beside the King's Highway, and there was a little fenced-in area for pilgrims to rest. Oh, just when they needed it, just when they absolutely couldn't go any further, the king had provided this place for them to rest, and they went in and lay down, and pilgrim fell fast asleep, and hopeful watched the moon reflecting off the waters, just thinking how beautiful it is. By the way, how many of you know there's a total eclipse of the moon tonight? Yeah, how many of you are going to be up at midnight to see it? <laughs> Not as many hands, several. Uh, total eclipse of the moon tonight, 1030 to midnight, somewhere in there. Uh, and I think we have clear skies to see it, so that's going to be exciting. The moon is just something neat to see. And yeah, it is kind of pretty on the water. And that's what uh, Hopeful was watching, the moon reflecting on the water. And finally, they both got a good night's sleep. And when you're tired and worn out, and you really do finally get a good night's sleep. You wake up in the morning just refreshed and ready to go again. So in the morning, as they're waking up, a messenger from the king shows up. And he says, no, not yet. <laughs> Scared her to death. He says, this is the valley of peace that the king has prepared for the pilgrims so that you can may." so that you may go and journey and you're refreshed and you got lots more things to do. And then guess what? Time's up. Then time's <laughs> up. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these children. Thank you again for John Bunyan who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, this allegory of the Christian life showing us so many pitfalls to avoid and so many wonderful things that God has prepared for us. Be with the children now as they go with Riley to Children's Church. Help them to learn more about you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls. Now, if you would stand, Jenny is going to lead us in God, You Are So Good.
Be seated, please. I love that. You know, we've sung the song, God is so good. But to sing it to God and say, God, you are so good, just seems so personal. So thank you, Jenny, for that. We want to welcome those who are visiting with us this morning in-house. Met some of you just a little bit ago, very briefly. I look forward to meeting you after the service. And then those watching on the Internet, either now or in the future, it is being recorded on several different platforms. We're so glad that you are all here. Uh, would the ushers please come for our morning tithes and offerings? Brother James. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you of the multiple ways to give to Calvary Brenham. You can give online at calvarybrenham.org, also on Amazon at amazon.com, and you can take advantage of the offering boxes at the back of the sanctuary. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give back a portion of that which is yours. We ask that you bless us all as we give this portion back that is used in a manner that is well-pleasing unto you. This we ask in your most holy name. Amen. <laughs> scripture reading will come to us from John chapter 5 verses 39 through 42. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. God bless the reading of your word this morning. Will you bow your head? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious opportunity we have to come together and study in your word this morning. We ask that you be with Pastor Billy as he delivers the message and open our hearts and our minds to use that message to be the Christians you wish us to be. This we ask in your most holy name. Amen. <laughs> It's not just about God, it's singing to God, to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit.
you may be seated. We are in the Gospel of John still, and uh, before we do that, I thought there was something in the bulletin to which I wanted to call your attention, and uh, yes, that is Dr. Bruce Baker honored, and I meant to have the film for that for our announcements, and I forgot to put it in there, um, but we showed that Wednesday night. And there's the website that you can go to, calvarybrenham.org slash resources, and you can see that video in its entirety. And then also we had mentioned the Where's Bill campaign. Uh, this is uh, a man who, from Brenham, uh, teaches a men's Bible study here for a number of years. When the war in Ukraine broke out, he went to Ukraine, uh, bought a van, uh, buys medicinal supplies and groceries and anything that he thinks people in Ukraine can need. He buys these in Poland and uh, wherever else he can get them and then goes across the border and drives into Ukraine and delivers these personally to people in need. So uh, Faith Mission is uh, coordinating this. I think all of the big banks, all of Brenham's banks have somewhere where you can donate towards that. This is one of those places you see on TV, all these tearjerker ads, you know, about give us money and about 10% of the money goes to 100% of this money, 100% of what you give will go to people in Ukraine. So uh, there is that information there in the bulletin, so avail yourself of that. And again, calvarybrenham.org, you can go to our website and you can see, I think I've got buttons at the top besides on the resource. So uh, avail yourself of that if you would like to. John chapter 5, um, John is still making the case for Christ. Lee Strobel, you remember, wrote the book, The Case for Christ. But long before that, uh, John, the revelator, wrote this, the best friend of Jesus. Jesus is the Christ, and that believing in him, you can have eternal life. John tells us at the end of the book, this, this is what this has all been about. So that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that in him you find eternal life. So he's closing He's, he's moving to closing arguments, and even though I say he's calling witnesses, he's not actually calling, he's reminding people, these are the witnesses that I have called. These are the people who have spoken. After this, in chapter 6, he moves on to the feeding of the 5,000, but the Jews never lose sight of the fact that they want this man dead, and it begins to get more and more intense. So verses 17 through 47, we're going to backtrack a little bit from last week this morning. Verses 17 through 47 is one long discourse, and too many times we break that up into sections not realizing that this part depends on that part being there, and this part depends on that part being there. Uh, Jesus is absolutely declaring his deity. There are still people in denominations that say Jesus never said that he was God. Maybe they never read John chapter 5, and uh, I think I'll say this a little bit later in one of the slides, but um, for a while leading into this, Jesus is talking in the third person. He's talking about the Son of Man. He's talking about the Son. He's talking about the Father and the Son, and then a, an amazing thing happens. He shifts just in case they're not getting it. He shifts to first person, I, me, and he's talking about that. Uh, he calls on John the Baptist. John the Baptist had preached and proclaimed and prepared the way for Jesus the Christ. The Holy Spirit was on John the Baptist, even in Elizabeth's womb. We read about that. He got a patriarchal blessing from the priest. Uh, John the Baptist was a very special person. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. No, I did not make a mistake. Even though he's in the New Testament, he is the last of the Old Testament prophets, and then things drastically change. So the Jews, and anytime Jesus refers to the Jews, particularly in the Gospel of John, he's talking about those religious leaders who are about to kill him, those religious leaders who have destroyed Judaism, who have perverted it beyond recognition. So uh, he calls on the Father by saying, those miracles that I did, I can't do anything without the Father. So it was the Father doing those miracles through me. I am the Father, are one. He's making that clear. He calls on Scripture uh, to the extent that he even says, later on, 
when you stand in judgment, it's not going to be me who's the prosecuting attorney in your situation. You're going to face Moses as the prosecutor. Moses, who you claim you obey by the Torah, the, 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 the uh, Moses' writings, the law, the lawgiver, you claim that he's the one you're following, he will be the one who will stand in judgment of you in the last days. And regardless of all this, they're unwilling to believe. Now, I'm going to make this point again, but let me just set it up. You are responsible as a Christian to tell other people about Jesus. You are not responsible for what they do with that. This should be a great comfort because you say, well, what if I say it wrong? What if I introduce it wrong? What if I, 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 I'm scared? And if all you do is say that Jesus is Lord, it's up to the Holy Spirit to use that. That's not on you. We are responsible to share the gospel. Now, here's Jesus sharing the gospel about eternal life. And even he can't get a lot of these people. They're unwilling. Unwilling means they have heard it and they have made the choice not to accept it when I was starting out in preaching I used to get discouraged sometimes when I knew that there was somebody lost in the audience and I preached a salvation message and I thought sure that they would come to a saving knowledge of Christ and it didn't happen and I felt like what else could I have done what did I do wrong how come they didn't come and it was such a relief to finally get it through my head my job is to preach the gospel their job is to receive or reject and once I've preached the gospel, this is the same for you. If you tell people about Jesus and they laugh at you or they just walk away in disbelief, that's on them. It does not relieve us of the obligation to tell people about Jesus, but it does not burden us with the responsibility of what they do with that. Here's a bunch of people who are unwilling to believe, and Jesus is making a very condemning case saying, look at the testimony that you've seen look at the evidence that you've seen and still you're not willing there's this phrase we use sharing jesus and the power of the holy spirit and leaving the results to god folks that's the key just pray about it go in the power of the holy spirit share the gospel and then leave the results to god if they accept the gospel glory glory to god if they don't You've done what you're supposed to do. Verse 16, backtracking a little bit from last week, this is the reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. The healings, we won't go back into all that. The healings on the Sabbath. Jesus is standing up to the Jews. Remember when John uses that phrase, the Jews, he's talking about the religious leaders who were so corrupt. It is the Father who enables Jesus to do the miracles they have seen, and he's going to make this a case. He's got, going to be saying, as a matter of fact, the, my Bible puts it, uh, the wind just blew the verses over. Hold on a second. The witness of John, the witness of works, the witness of the Father, and the witness of the Scripture are the major headings that I have for the rest of the Scripture. But I could combine the witness of works and the witness of the Father into one because Jesus said, I can't do the works except the Father do them. I can only do what I see the Father do. And we're going to look at an interesting slant on that in just a moment. Verse 18 they begin to earnestly look to murder him. Just from verse 16 to verse 18, it intensifies. They're looking to kill him. Verse 17, but he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. I can only do what the father tells me to do, what he shows me to do for this reason. Therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only uh, was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father. If Today's people don't understand that Jesus was equating himself with God. His original audience, the Jews who hated him, they understood it quite well, so much so that they saw it as a reason for him to be killed. They believed it that, string, that, that strongly. So notice as we're going to go through these next verses, as I've already mentioned, the third party references, the son can do nothing, the son also does, the father loves the son just as the father raises the dead, the son, uh, the judgment would be given to the son. There are all these third parties, it's like he's easing into it, but the Jews know exactly who he's talking about it, and then he's going to bring it on home. Verse 30 changes to first person. So verse 19 Therefore Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son, third person, 
can do nothing of himself, third person, unless it is something he sees, the third person, the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things, the Son, you get the clue, you get the picture. It's always the third person uh, uh, format that he's talking in. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Verse 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. Verse 22, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. In the case of the Jews, Jesus is going to give that judgment apparently to Moses, but it is his to give because God gave it to him. Verse 23, and that brings home the point that we've been saying that Jesus is God's agent of creation, he is God's agent of redemption, and he is God's agent of judgment. A lot of people like to leave that last part out. Truly, truly, and when you see that verily, verily, or truly, truly, Jesus is speaking truth to a falsehood. This is what you guys think, but this is the way it really is when you see truly, truly. He did this several times with Nicodemus. This is what you thought, but this is what is true. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, I say to you, first person, and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of uh, uh, death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who will hear will live. Just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. There's a whole sermon in there that we'll not get into this morning about the two resurrections. Uh, we're going to go on to verse uh, 30 in a minute. Just in case they don't get it, he starts now with the I, me, we, Jesus is talking about God, and we are the same. He makes it abundantly clear that the Son that he's been talking about in the third person is in fact himself, and the Father, his Father, the God of heaven and earth, no mistake to them, Jesus is clearly making himself equal to God, equal in works, equal in judgment, and equal in deserving worship. Verse uh, 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, that first part of that verse, I can do nothing on my own initiative, uh, keep that in mind. As we talk about the age-old argument, could Jesus have sinned if he wanted to? We've even discussed this on Wednesday night a couple of times. And uh, if the, the argument kind of goes like, if, if Jesus was incapable of sinning, then what did he prove by honoring his father? Because he was just kind of a robot. And he couldn't sin anyway, so why the temptation if he couldn't sin? And the other argument is... He was in every sense like man and was tempted in every sense like man. Well, this is nothing new. This has been going on for ages and ages and ages. And in the Latin, posse non pecari means able not to sin. And this is some of the early church fathers said that Jesus was able not to sin. But he could have if he wanted to. And then the opposite of that is non posse pecari. He's not able to sin. He is incapable of sin. And if you think about that second one, think about what Jesus has just said there. I can do nothing apart from my Father. That, to me, would indicate Jesus could not sin. Non posse peccari, he was incapable of sin because Jesus said, I could do nothing on my own initiative. Verse 31, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, here's an interesting thing. Follow this with me. Jesus is saying, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. But yet in chapter 8, verse 14, he says, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. 
oh, wow, there's a conflict in the Bible, right? Jesus said one thing, and now he's saying the exact opposite. You have to remember who his audience is in John chapter 5. He's talking to the religious leaders. He's talking on their terms. They're already deciding that he's not the Christ. They don't have to obey him. They don't have to listen to him. So it's more like Jesus is playing their game. Okay, go back to Deuteronomy. You're all worried about Moses and what he said. Deuteronomy says, um, in the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. So if I say it all by myself, you're not going to accept that testimony. So let me, let, me just, let me just go ahead with you on that point, and let me give you more testimony from others greater than John the Baptist. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. And I can just see the Jews perking up, okay, who he's, who's he got? Who, who's going to witness? Who's going to testify on his behalf like that? And he starts with the witness of John the Baptist, whom they've already talked about, they've already heard, they've already uh, witnessed the crowds that gathered when John the Baptist was preaching. They have uh, already acknowledged that John the Baptist was indeed a prophet sent from God. They already acknowledged that John the Baptist was a prophet. Now, keep in mind that when Jesus is talking here, John the Baptist is either in prison or already dead depending on the timeline. So Jesus is saying, you listen to him for a while. Now, now you can't listen to him anymore because he's dead. Um, but the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. What is the purpose of the Gospel of John? To declare that Jesus is the Christ, and in him you have eternal life. Verse 35 he was the lamp. Who's he? John the Baptist. He was the lamp, the, the little light. He was the little spotlight on me. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. John the Baptist was the one preparing the way. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. There was all kinds of hoopla. There were, crowds followed him all over the place. There were mass baptisms, and everybody was proclaiming what wonderful John was. And you have his witness. Now you'd like to pretend that never happened. And he's got the witness of the Father. Because he says, but the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. Remember that Jesus had declared that John was the greatest man who ever lived. But now there's somebody greater than that. Not a man, but God. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish... The very works that I do testify about me. He gives me these works to do. I do them in his power. We do these together. We are one. They testify about me that the Father has sent me. I'm here doing his work. I am here in his name. I am here in his power. We are one. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. But woe unto you. Because you wouldn't know his voice if you heard it. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. All you guys have is words on pages, scrolls, texts. You do not have his word abiding in you, and you do not believe in whom you do not believe him whom he sent. The witness of the scripture. So a lot of times we use this, I use John 30, uh, 5, 39, and 40 uh, in, in declaring that Jesus said he's talking to the religious leaders and he says, uh, you guys search the scriptures and in them you think you have eternal life. That's not an isolated incident. That's part of this case that Jesus is building. You've got John the Baptist, you've got God the Father, and you have the Holy Scriptures. So he's turning to them and now talking about the scriptures. You search, and that word search means a technical or, a, or a, an exhaustive search. You, you're combing over the scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life. You hold it from everybody else because you've turned Judaism into a religion of works. And, and you've made it that they have to obey all these laws and way more laws than the Ten Commandments and laws that even you yourselves cannot hold up to 
you search the scriptures. You, you guys, you Jews are the very ones who search the scriptures and in them you think you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And then verse 40, so sad, and you are unwilling to come to me that you might have life. You want life? You search the scriptures. They're, they're talking about me. John has testified about me. Um, the Father has testified about me. You've seen the marvelous works and the wonders. All of this evidence, and look at that word, you are unwilling. You're making a conscious decision. And you will find people, when you try to tell them about Jesus, they're unwilling even to listen. Doesn't change the fact that we have a responsibility to try to tell them. And then what they do with that is up to them. Jesus is talking to the Jews, and he's present. Look at the evidence that he is presenting. And, and even they, with Jesus, the Son of God, presenting the case, they're unwilling. What makes you think you have any more power over lost people than Jesus? I do not receive glory from men. That's not his purpose. But I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. They're already mad at him, and he's forevermore telling the truth. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you receive him. But, but here I am, with all of the evidence, with all of the testimony, with all of the proof, and, and you just absolutely refuse. And the implication we can see from the other scriptures is because you've got your own system and it will destroy your system. Years ago, there was a story told by Paul Little who had spoken at a conference at a university and uh, he was doing an apologetic speech telling about why you should believe that Jesus is God. He wrote the books that we've studied on a Wednesday night some time back, uh, Know What You Believe and Know Why You Believe. And Paul Little was teaching at the seminary. He's presenting this apologetic case to a large audience. And when he was all done, a young man came up to him and said, Sir, I just want to tell you that you have successfully answered every argument I have ever had for not believing in Jesus. And Paul said, Is that right? He said, yes, sir. He said, then you're ready to accept Christ as Savior? He said, no, I'm not. And Paul said, but, but you just said I've answered every objection that you've ever had to Jesus being who he is and, and salvation. Why would you not accept Christ as Savior? And this young man said, because it would mess up the way I live. It would mess up the way I live. And there are a lot of people who will not bow before Christ because they've made the decision that I'm going to serve my own desires, I'm going to serve Satan, and they are unwilling to look at the evidence and see that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another? You guys pat yourselves on the back and, and you promote one another and you get bigger and bigger gowns and bigger and bigger headdresses and kind of sounds like one of our denominations today that, that uh, you, you get all of this outward glory and all respect from men. That, that's what you're all about, and, and I'm, not, I'm not that. My job here is to please the Father. When you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God, are you here to please men or are you here to please God? And you realize that a lot of times when you're purposely pleasing God, you're going to make some people pretty unhappy. And when you're pleasing men, you're going to disappoint God a whole bunch. Choose ye this day whom you shall serve. As for me and my house. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. Jesus is saying this to the Jews. The one who accuses you is Moses in whom you have set your hope. You're, you're searching the scriptures. You think you got everything all figured out. One day Moses is going to point out, boy, you guys missed it bad. You really, really missed it. Because in all of the Old Testament, we see the projection that there will be a Messiah. And we see the scriptures saying that that Messiah will be Jesus. We see the scriptures fulfilled. We see prophecies fulfilled in Jesus Christ being that Messiah. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. 
for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So, this should be a pretty easy question. Do you believe Christ? The vast majority of you here this morning, probably a bunch of you on the internet, will say, well, yeah, of course I believe Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm in a Christian church. I'm here to learn more about Jesus, and I'm here to worship Him, and I'm here to sing praises to Him. And, and, and yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's the purpose of the Gospel of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And secondarily, and in Him you have eternal life. And then are you telling people about Him? Because this is plan A, and there is no plan B. When Jesus entrusted the kingdom into the disciples and said, go and tell the world, he, he didn't say, okay, and if that doesn't work, then this is what I'm going to do. He's counting on us to tell people about Jesus. And so many Christians are so scared to do that because they might not be received well. Look at how Jesus was not received well. They killed him. And you simply need to tell them about Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Are you aware you're only responsible for the telling? We, we've talked about that already, so I'm not going to drive that home. I think you get that. It is our responsibility to tell people about Jesus. And again, sharing Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. It's not up to me to convince somebody. As a matter of fact, if I can argue somebody into Jesus, somebody else can probably argue them out of Jesus. It's not about an argument. It's about the evidence of who God is, who Jesus is, who He was, who He is. It's all about the, the truth of the Scripture. It's all about the testimony of John the Baptist, of Moses, of the Scripture, of the Father, of the miracles. So much testimony that we have that our job is simply just tell people about Jesus, and we have lots of Christians who have never told a single person about Jesus. Well, that's the pastor's job. Show me where that is in the Bible. Show me in the Bible where it's the pastor's job to tell people about Jesus, and everybody else gets a free pass. It's not in there. Go into all the world, followers of Jesus. And I think this is where we have a problem with this between a Christian and a disciple. They should be the same thing, but unfortunately too many times we have people who accept Jesus and become a Christian, but they never become a disciple where they're following Him and telling people about Jesus and doing the work of the Father. Are you telling people about Jesus? And it's this simple. Tell people about Jesus as much or as little as you want to in the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, I pray if there's anybody here this morning who's never accepted you as Savior, either in this room or watching on the Internet, now or in the future. Father, I pray for their salvation. Father, for the young man I talked to last night, I pray, Father, that he will come to a saving knowledge of you. I pray, Father, that you will give us the holy boldness as Christians to realize our responsibility is to tell people about Jesus and the power of the Spirit and then leave the results to you. Be with us now in this time of invitation. However you have spoken, Father, I pray that people will respond. In Jesus' name, let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Oh, soul, are you
say amen. Amen. And our benediction is from John chapter 20, verse 31. I know we've been using this for quite a while now, but hopefully it's going to help you memorize it, right? Read each line as though it were a sentence. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let's be dismissed with singing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story.